The year of the monkey began with blood. The enemy struck across the length and breadth of South Vietnam, shattering what had been a holiday truce. The holiday was Tet, the Lunar New Year. For the first time, the Viet Cong invaded the cities in force, including Saigon itself. A suicide attack into the grounds of the American embassy. In Hue, the ancient imperial capital, communist troops established a revolutionary government and held out for more than three weeks of bitter fight. At Quezon in the northwest, American Marines were surrounded and under siege, depending on airstrikes to hold off a threatened enemy attack. The deadly battles of 1968, the Tet Offensive. If you had to choose the most important event of the Vietnam War, it certainly would be the Tet Offensive. It changed how people looked at the war, and in doing so, it changed the war itself. Consider what was happening at the start of 1968. Almost half a million American troops were in Vietnam. Our leaders, both civilian and military, were optimistic that the war was being won. The commanding general, William Westmoreland, declared, we have reached an important point where the end begins to come into view. Emergency medevac ASAP! But there had Stop been some unusual developments. The communists, who had been fighting mainly a guerrilla war, had begun heavy attacks on scattered American bases, including the Marine fire base at Contien. Military intelligence had picked up signs that the communists were planning a major offensive. They thought the attack might come just before or after Tet. They did not expect it would involve the cities or happen during the New Year's celebration. Tet is the most sacred of Vietnam's holidays, a time for visiting relatives, a time for feasting and firecrackers. As Tet arrived in 1968, a ceasefire was declared in most of Vietnam. President Chu ordered holiday leaves for half of South Vietnam's armed forces. And then the enemy struck all over South Vietnam. More than a hundred cities, provincial capitals, towns, and military bases. You'll see the Tet Offensive as it was reported then by CBS News correspondents and camera crews. The enemy's targets included the American Embassy in Saigon, and Robert Shackney was there. Military police got back into the compound of the two and a half million dollar embassy complex at dawn. Before that, a platoon of Viet Cong were in control. The communist raiders never got into the main chancery building. A handful of Marines had it locked and kept them out. But the raiders were everywhere else. By daylight, Tang Yang Boulevard, where the embassy is located, was a battleground. No one, unless identified, was allowed in the street. An Australian military policeman was standing guard, firing warning shots to keep the street clear. The bodies of two American military policemen who died as they tried to assault the compound lay near their jeep across the boulevard. This is where the Viet Cong raiders broke in. They'd sneaked up and blasted a hole in the reinforced concrete fence surrounding the compound. They had the big embassy wall to protect them. They were inside before anyone knew it. But none of the raiders lived to tell of their exploit. By eight o'clock, five hours after they first broke in, almost all of them were dead. All in civilian clothes, they'd been armed with American M-16 rifles and also rocket launchers and rockets. They had explosives, their purpose apparently to destroy the embassy. In that purpose, they did not succeed. A villa on the embassy grounds was the residence of the mission coordinator, George Jacobson. He was trapped there on the second floor. 
American soldiers tossed him weapons to defend himself. Later, when it was all over, Jacobson told what had happened. What could you see from your window? Were the, were the VC in the buildings? No, I did not see any VC in the building, except that I knew that there was at least one VC in my house. Uh, I knew that he was um, on the bottom floor of my house. You had uh, quite a, an escape at the very end. How did that happen? Well, they put riot gas into the bottom floors of my house, which, of course, would drive whoever was down uh, below up top where I was. Uh, they had thrown me a pistol uh, about 10 minutes before this occurred. And uh, uh, with all the luck that I've had uh, all of my life, uh, I got him before he got me. With the I'm pistol, sorry. and he had what? An M16. And you got him. The commanding general, William Westmoreland, described the embassy attack as a Viet Cong defeat. General, how would you uh, assess yesterday's activities and today's? What is the enemy doing? Are these major attacks or... That's uh, EOD setting off a couple of M79 uh, duds, I believe. General, how would you assess the enemy's uh, purposes yesterday and today? Uh, the, the enemy very deceitfully has taken advantage of the Tet Truce in order to uh, create max, maximum consternation uh, within uh, South Vietnam, uh, particularly in the populated areas. In my opinion, this is diversionary uh, to his uh, main effort, which uh, he had planned to take place in Quang Tri province. Uh, from uh, Laos uh, toward Khe Sanh and across the demilitarized zone. Uh, this attack has not yet materialized. It is, his schedule has probably been thrown off balance because of our very effective airstrikes. Now, yesterday, the enemy exposed himself by virtue of this strategy, and he suffered great casualties. Other battles were raging in the streets of Saigon, one not far from the presidential palace. An attack on the palace itself had been driven back. The enemy had been planning the Tet Offensive for the past six months. Almost 100 tons of military supplies had been moved into the region around Saigon. The Viet Cong had chosen a number of strategic targets. Don Webster described the battle for one of them. This is the main Vietnamese language radio station in Saigon. And right now there are an undisclosed number of VC inside occupying the station. They are not broadcasting on the air, and they're surrounded by South Vietnamese troops. And they're pinned down inside. We think they're going to be throwing... Uh, we think they're going to be throwing tear gas any moment now to try to get them out that way. There's been a lot of shooting out the windows from inside, up on the second floor. The attack on the radio station started at 2.30 in the morning. The Viet Cong pulled up in cars. They killed the guards outside and stormed the station. The suicide squad of Viet Cong apparently intended to blow up the station rather than just taking it over. The large packages carry plastique, more than enough to blow up the entire station, including the Viet Cong. Even now, eight hours after the attack started, there are still a few Viet Cong hiding inside the station. One by one, the VC are located and killed, and their bodies are unceremoniously dragged outside and down the street. The communists did not succeed in broadcasting from the station, but they did destroy much of its equipment before they were killed or captured. Five days after the combat began, the enemy was still fighting. George Severson described the battle in one of Saigon's slums. This neighborhood is called Ban Kuo, or the chessboard, because of the maze of alleys and passageways. Its residents are mostly poor working people, and its slums are a refuge for Saigon's hoodlum and criminal elements a Southeast Asian version of the Lower East Side or the Algerian Kasbah. Vietnamese Rangers and Marines moved carefully, blasting buildings and possible Viet Cong hiding places before moving ahead. This was the first time heavy fighting has taken place in Saigon proper. Until now, most of it has been in the Chinese section of Cholan and in the suburbs. 
The VC were difficult to dislodge. They obviously knew the section well and had built barricades in key spots. Often, the only way around them was to take to the roof. The Rangers and Marines took casualties, mostly from hidden snipers. The enemy was nowhere and everywhere. As soon as a section had been cleared, more terror-stricken civilians scurried out of their homes. Thousands of them fleeing from the bullets and explosives, and even more dangerous, a fire that began to rage out of control. Residents in nearby buildings began dragging their most precious possessions out of their shops and homes. Saigon's water supply system is operating only at 70% of normal, so fires are a serious menace. For these people, many of them who fled the war from outlying villages, this is the cruelest blow. The curfew has kept them from making a living. Food prices have tripled since the fighting began a week ago. And now, their homes are being destroyed. The fighting is taking place around the Cho Rei Hospital in Cholan, the Chinese section of the city. The most unnerving part of this kind of fighting is the possibility of snipers popping out of practically every doorway, every window. They're equipped with rifles, machine guns, and rocket launchers. How long have you been fighting in Saigon? It's broke out about six, seven days ago. I've been fighting ever since then. You've been fighting out in the field, too? Right. Which do you prefer? Field. <laughs> Why? I don't know. You can't find them around here. In the field, at least you can call in airstrikes or something if something happens. This is Saigon Hospital in downtown Saigon. It's been working overtime since the beginning of the Great Tet Offensive, and it's in hospitals like this all over the country that the real tragedy of the fighting can be seen. Over 3,000 wounded have been admitted to Saigon's nine civilian hospitals. Cases like these, bullet and shrapnel wars. More than 200 have died in the hospitals. No one knows how many have died without reaching them. Hardly a day has passed in this war without the death or wounding of innocent civilians. But up until now, this has been mainly in the countryside. Now the Viet Cong have carried the war into the cities, and there seems to be no place to hide from the bombs and the bullets. George Sievertson, CBS News, in Saigon. The fighting was even more savage here, in Hue, the former imperial capital, considered by most visitors to be the most beautiful and serene city in all of Vietnam. Tet changed all that. On the north side of the Perfume River, the enemy took control of much of the citadel, an almost impenetrable fortress built in 1802. But South Vietnamese forces held on to the northeast corner. On the south side of the river, Communist forces attacked the U.S. military advisory compound. American Marines were called in to break the siege, but the progress was slow and deadly. John Lawrence was there. On the fifth day of the battle for Hue, the Marines moved out from the fortified army compound that withstood the original attack and advanced into the empty, abandoned buildings of what was Hue University. Hue, the ancient imperial city, it is to Vietnamese what old Boston is to Americans, where many of its country's leaders are born or educated, where many returned to celebrate Tet a week ago when the fighting began, where many remain hidden in the unknown interior of the resistance. Colonel Cheatham, uh, what's the objective and your, what are your men about to do? Well, I've, I've got two companies here that are just about to clear the next two blocks up. Uh, I've got one company in this, in this big building here that I guess it's the end of the Way University, and they are going to start firing in support of Foxtrot Company, which will be going up this road here on the left and attempt to take a couple large wall buildings that are on up about five or 600 meters. What kind of fighting is it going to be? It's house to house and from room to room. Nope. Kind of inch by inch. That's, that's exactly what it is. Had you ever expected to experience this kind of street fighting in Vietnam? No, I didn't, and this is the, my first crack at uh, street fighting. I think this is the first time the Marine Corps has been street fighting since Seoul in 1950. 
and a little bit in Santo Domingo. And a little bit there, yes, right. What's going to happen to civilians who might get caught in there? Well, we're hoping that we don't run into any, any civilians in there right now. If they are, I'm pretty sure there are civilians that are the, what we would consider the bad guys right now. We have certain areas in here that we have blocked off that we know there are friendly civilians and we aren't going to take those under fire. The others? The others, if there's somebody in there right now, they're Charlie as far as we're concerned. Contact. The first sniper shots ricochet around the thick walls of the building, taking the first casualties of the first squad. The snipers, maybe only two or three, are invisible in the buildings beyond the wall. But there is also a machine gun down the street to the left. They have covered every angle but the few feet of dirt and cactus behind this wall and the one 40 feet ahead. The platoon leader has called his men forward. There is to be an assault. First, a barrage of cover fire and then a charge across the street. The assault. But only one Marine runs forward into the fire. Expecting the others to follow, not looking back to find out, disappears behind the cover at the wall and before long is shot and wounded. Two other Marines, one of whom is killed, get beyond the wall. And by night and the next day, the Marines have not been fired. It is inch by shattered inch in the five-day battle for Hue. Much of the news filmed during Tet was flown to Tokyo and fed to New York by satellite. In some cases, only those early satellite feeds remain. The picture's less than perfect, but gripping nonetheless. Here, a Marine corporal moves into the line of fire to rescue a wounded corpsman. A few days later, Don Webster witnessed another act of courage. For days now, they've been fighting their way, bloody inch by inch, down Leloy Street. And all that time, they could see down the street a flagpole, and on it was a Viet Cong flag. Much is left in shambles. As the Marines advance, building after building, the North Vietnamese retreat, building after building, giving up nothing without a fight. Roger, that was, a, that was some sort of rifle uh, grenade. It came all the way through the building, hit up. Have you, have you pushed forward? In the front ranks of the Marines, a man is suddenly wounded. He's been hit in the eye by shrapnel from an enemy B-40 rocket. Despite the obvious pain, doctors later told him he will not lose the eye. And although the sound of the blast punctured his eardrum, he will not lose his hearing. But all the time, the Marines have had their eyes on that enemy flag. It's flying on a pole in front of the province capital building. We've got, uh, got Charlie on the run behind him. They're cutting him down now. As soon as the pink one's secured, the flag Finally, the assault. They're approaching what used to be the most important government building in the province. Now, with no province government at all, it has no significance at all except for the flag in front. With fighting still going on just a few yards away, Marines have risked their lives to pull down this symbol. No one is quite sure where the American flag came from in the middle of a battle. Like so many things, when you need something, someone just happens to have it. There was no bugler, and the other Marines were too busy to salute but not often is a flag so proudly raised. All right. All right, give me this, eh? Hungry Hard Hotel Company. <laughs> Keep it. Are you finished? We want to get the hell out. Hey, that is certainly a surprise. Still alive! 
Hey, get over here and help me drag this man out of here. Rimming the edge of the courtyard, someone noticed small holes camouflaged. In almost every one, there's an enemy soldier. A few dead from the day shooting, but some still alive. Others are not so lucky. Marines fire into the holes. Another one is lucky. He stuck his arms out of the hole and surrender as the Marine approached, and he's pulled out alive and uninjured. Somebody find a piece of blindfold, a piece of rag over there. Get some of that gear over there. Hey, John! Oh, we're good. Get some of that clothing over there. Make a Sometimes these prisoners can be very useful, giving valuable intelligence information. But in this battle in Hue, it's been going on for so long now, and there are so many prisoners, there's really nothing left to be learned. For one of the few times in the Vietnam War, the U.S. Marines are really in their element in this battle in Hue. For right now, this province headquarters is the front line, and they're holding an assault much like those that have made them famous in other wars. And to a great extent, this assault is being won or lost, on the basis of sheer courage, and there's no shortage of that among the Marines. Don Webster, CBS News, in Hue, South Vietnam. While the battles were raging in Saigon and Hue and elsewhere in South Vietnam, the Marines at Khe San were waiting for a showdown. Khe San was an isolated base in the northwest corner of South Vietnam. It was built to control enemy infiltration, and 6,000 men were there to defend it. Waiting in the mountains around them were 20 to 40,000 North Vietnamese. As time went on, Khe San took on an almost mystical significance. It reminded some experts of Dien Bien Phu, where the French were defeated in 1954. The Marines at Khe San were under orders to defend the base at all costs. President Johnson had declared, I don't want any damn Dien Bien Phu. He'd ordered his Joint Chiefs of Staff to pledge that Khe San would not be lost. But Khe San was surrounded, and few there doubted the enemy would attack. So they dug in and watched and waited as American airstrikes pounded the hills nearby. Already the guns in those hills had been pouring fire on Khe San. The question now, would the communists try to overrun the base? Peter Kalischer reported. All right, this again, he's dropping two now, right in those trees. Gee whiz. That sounds good to you. <laughs> this is the first clear day in weeks, and Marine and Air Force pilots celebrate it by working over the slopes of Hill 1015 that dominate the camp. This is Khe San, the dartboard of Northwest South Vietnam. The usual quick step of landing and taking off under enemy fire. A 105 howitzer coming in. Do the communists seem to uh, work on a schedule? You get fire uh, more at one period of the day than another? Well, myself, I think it's just when the uh, 130s are coming in, planes are coming in. Of course, you can't always. Uh, Count on that either, but that's when we all head for cover when the 130 comes in. You, you'll always hear somebody yell, "Here comes a mortar magnet!" And everybody heads for the holes. We stay down there until we hear them take off, and then we'll come back up and try to go back to work. And there's sometimes you do—it's uh, a half-hour job to do, and you take two hours doing it. Just doing five minutes work, running the holes, wait 15 minutes, run back out, do another five minutes work, and then run back to your hole. The Marines are long on courage and short on dug-in positions. How much of the day's work is this sandbag stuff? Just about a full day for a long, long time. How come you fellas haven't got a thicker cover of this stuff? You've got about two layers here. Well, we got about, this makes about the fourth or fifth layer we got right now besides the helo mats, which is made out of steel. Oh, this is six layers. Six layers, excuse me. 
What'll that, what'll that keep out? Right now, it should stop a small mortar. What about a big one? I hope so. <laughs> I'm not sure, though. Uh, what do you think of the, uh, what do you think of the chance, what do you think of the chances of um, this place getting overrun? I would not say, sir. I, I couldn't say. I know every night we stand 100% watch all night long and try to get sleep during the daytime. And uh, working parties also when a fog comes in, everybody starts building bunkers up there just like they do here, filling sandbags, digging trenches deeper. That's about all I is to it. Well, thanks, and I hope you have a good R&R. &R. Uh, I'd like to say hi to Mom back there at home. I know she's worried about me and had, had no mail or resupply. So uh, to Mama back there in Greenfield, Tennessee, hello, Mama. The siege of Quezon had begun 10 days before the Tet Offensive. The first shelling of the base exploded the ammunition dump. From then on, the base suffered a daily ordeal of fire. By the time the full-scale Tet Offensive began, the enemy had been spotted within a few hundred yards of the perimeter. Do you worry at all with, uh, with the enemy that close to the, to the edge of this place? Yeah, you gotta be an idiot not to worry. What are you thinking now? Oh, right now, maybe a little jumping on the count of the audience and the rockets that they're throwing in here, being that I am short. What do you mean by short? I'm ready to go home, maybe about 20 days. 20 days to go and, and a big attack supposed to be coming? Well, if it come, we'll fight our battles. If it don't, that's it. What do you think's gonna happen if they try to take this place? You're gonna get waxed. You're gonna get hurt bad, real bad. waited at Quezon. A few of them strummed guitars and sang about war and talked with John Lawrence. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? This is the part of Quezon known as the V-Ring, the impact zone for most of the incoming enemy mortars, rockets, and artillery. It's the home of 3rd Recon Bravo Company. And even in the V-Ring, life goes on at Quezon. How do you, uh, how do you manage to survive in the V-Ring? How do you keep your spirits up and no, I guess we play cards and sing at night. How about you? How do you manage to keep your spirits going? There's not many ways, really. Sometimes it gets pretty, pretty irritating down there. You have a lot of guys living close together and everything. It gets kind of, you get kind of crabby and everything. You start biting everyone, but we manage. Our one beer a night helps. <laughs> learn to take the danger of death which is kind of present all around you can you take that in stride yeah you just you grow used to it you just uh, accept it you know you still you jump and everything when mortars and rockets come in but you just accept it after a while some of your buddies get blown away and you just uh, next day you just you know just like you have a wall between yourself and reality just love
By the end of the first week of the Tet Offensive, the enemy had been driven back from most of South Vietnam's cities. But the fighting continued in Saigon, where the Viet Cong blended with the population by day and launched new attacks by night. Here's another report from John Lawrence. It is the 10th day of the fighting for Saigon, and although the official military word is that these are only mopping up operations, a pitched running battle has been fought in these streets last night and today and is continuing. And the area beyond is still held by the Viet Cong. In five separate actions last night, at least 100 Viet Cong, seven Americans, and an unannounced number of government troops were killed within five miles of the downtown section of Saigon. These are local force enemy troops, some of whom have never before been committed to battle recruited, organized, trained, and deployed within a mile of the presidential palace. They were armed with the latest Chinese weapons, AK-50 assault rifles, up-to-date B-40 rockets. How, how long has he been a VC? How long a VC? Fifteen days. Fifteen days. Only 15 days. Yeah. Win Van Ton, 28, says he was picked up a week ago in his home in the Jadin suburb of Saigon and forced to carry ammunition for the Viet Cong. Tuan says there are many Viet Cong in Saigon, but for himself, he wants to go home to Jadin. He will go to a prison instead. It was the toughest battle for the 35th Ranger Battalion in the seven months Captain Robert Wrights has been its advisor. Did you see a lot of the snipers? Right, we saw a lot of them in the alleys. Uh, so I saw more this time than I've seen before in all the fights. In all of Vietnam? Right, seven months here. A government medical team races up, and although they must wait for last, the captured prisoners get as serious attention as any civilian or friendly soldier. The afternoon siesta in Saigon today is not a time for fighting, but fingerprinting. The military commander of the operation to secure Saigon, General Nguyen Lok Luan, arrives for an inspection. General Luan gets special attention from the troops. He often leads his national police in action. And last week, he showed them just how tough he is by shooting and killing a prisoner in cold blood. General Luan does not want to talk into the microphone. My mother, he says, told me a long time ago the best way to stay alive is to keep my mouth shut. Is the general afraid to die? What is life, he laughs, and what is death to a military man? John Lawrence, CBS News, Cholon. In a way, meantime, American forces had secured much of the south side of the river but communist troops were still holding out in the citadel. The fire from both sides of the river was murderous, and much of way was being destroyed in the process. Murray Frompson described the combat. U.S. Marines are trying to sweep North Vietnamese troops from the citadel toward the banks of the Perfume River and into a gauntlet of fire. See that causeway bridge? Yes, sir. Okay, see those houses all along there right below that? Yes, sir. Okay, put about three in there, and then you see that uh, wooded area to the right of that? Yes, sir. Just throw those in there for a reason. Almost all restraint is off. For the first time, the Vietnamese are seeing the holocaust of conventional war, the kind that leveled much of Korea and destroyed dozens of cities in World War II. Correction, you go right about 150 meters. To the right? You see a right. whole bunch of uh, a brush, right. and then you see this one little tin roof sticking up. Right, right in the center. See it right through there? Oh, which tan roof? The one just to about, about now, one finger to the right. Okay, you see this tall tree standing all yeah, by right, itself right, there? The one Come left of that about 100 meters. To the left, and they one little building sitting there by itself. Right. Uh,
Hui is being systematically destroyed, and there is no haven for the spectators. The communists return mortar and sniper fire, trying to silence the American guns. Instead, they hit civilians, who run, but often not fast enough. It will be a long time before normalcy ever returns here. Hue, once Vietnam's diamond in the rough, has lost all of its glitter. It will never be the same. On the far side of that river, the citadel was demonstrating how well an ancient fortress can stand up to modern weapons. This again is an early satellite feed, so the picture quality suffers. But I think you'll get the idea. And the correspondent is Robert Shackney. What remains of an old tower fortress built more than a century ago again is put to combat use. That's the North Vietnamese strong point. That's where the snipers are. That's where the rocket firing had been coming from. Now the Marines are trying to silence the firing with grenade launchers. A medieval battlement turns out to be a formidable strong point against 20th century guns. A tank is no more successful than the grenades, or the artillery, or the infantry. Charlie is still in there. The Viet Cong were still holding out four days later when this correspondent reported from Hue. We're in an observation point overlooking a house some mile and a quarter across the hills there where it is believed 120 V.C. are holed up and perhaps a large supply of ammunition. And Major Booth here is calling down artillery fire from some 10 miles back there on that target. The battle for Way has taken an odd turn here. I still hope that in a day or two or three days, the Marines will have cleared that section across the Perfume River over there in the Citadel, but they're waiting for air power to give them a little assist. And the weather has been frightful here for three weeks. American Marines had crossed the Perfume River to help attack the Citadel. John Lawrence went with them. The American flag flies on the Citadel wall, but there is no breeze to blow it and the job is far from done for Delta Bravo Company. The last 200 yards are the toughest. The North Vietnamese are deeply entrenched in buildings and bunkers, carefully camouflaged, waiting for the Marines to move forward to gun them down in the open. They have been holding up for three weeks in what has become the longest, bloodiest battle of the war. In the week of fighting inside the Citadel, the Marines have had an average of one tank a day knocked out. This is not the first big battle for 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. In the last six months, since the Quezon Valley ambush, so many men have been killed or wounded, out of an original 800-man force, fewer than 20 are veterans. The men on the line, the Marine grunts, have had enough of the Citadel. Many people are hurting real bad right now. We lost 2nd platoon. They were wiped out in part of 1st platoon. They lost a lot of people. We probably have to drop back today to regroup. How do you feel yourself? I'm scared, I guess. Could this just as easily be another time in another place, maybe 25 years ago in another part of the world? Yeah, I, I thought of that. I really have. Uh, I really have. This is really a, really a, a formidable, fortified position. I just can't imagine one being any uh, more difficult than this right here. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get it sooner or later, just take a little time. Hopefully the weather will improve and uh, we can get the maximum amount of air support and uh, the support that we really want, and then I don't think it'll be tough at all. On the 21st day of the Battle for Way, the commanders decided that this battalion had suffered enough. Plans were made to take it out and send in replacements. And the advance in the Citadel stopped, 200 yards from the wall. It would take three more days to capture the citadel. When South Vietnamese troops moved in, they would find the enemy had fled. Much of the city was destroyed. Refugees were everywhere, more than 100,000 homeless. 
many crowding into the shambles of what had been Hui University. The backyard became a graveyard. There were other graveyards in Hui, but they were not discovered till later. Searchers found the bodies of almost 3,000 civilians, intellectuals, religious and political leaders, foreigners, most apparently executed by the Viet Cong. Some bound and shot or bludgeoned to death. Others buried alive. As the Tet Offensive ground to a halt in most of South Vietnam, attention was focused back on Khe San, still braced for a major attack. The biggest problem was resupplying the base. There was no access by road. Everything had to be brought in by air. The North Vietnamese pounded Khe San with mortars, rockets, artillery. This is an Air Force transport hit as it tried to take off. Another round hit a CBS News crew filming the fire two wounded. Increasingly, the North Vietnamese were zeroing in on the airstrip, leaving behind the wreckage of planes and helicopters. Resupplying Khe San became one of the most dangerous missions of the war. Jeff Grounick described one flight. All of this is bound for Khe San tons of ammunition and other supplies to be parachuted into the Marines sometime later today or tomorrow. Resupply from the air, now just about the only way to get material into the Marine outpost. After takeoff, loadmasters check the cargo. Each man has made eight runs over Quezon in recent days, being shot at every time, having their planes hit once or twice, but so far staying lucky, getting back every time. And now, into the final run over Quezon. Okay, uh, Flying Eagle, did you get any pops up there where you were? Good job, Tom. Be advised, we took a couple incoming rounds near the air freight ramp about a minute ago. Uh, they are, be advised, they are taking incoming rounds at this time. You can probably see some of them. The 130 is now doing just about 170 miles an hour, only 500 feet over the ground. Low and slow, a perfect target. Five seconds. Ready? Ready, green light. Just after the drop, a wild, twisting climb for altitude. Quezon falling away behind us, the pilot taking violent evasive action to keep from being hit now that the job is done. But the enemy gunners had their problems too. They continue to take a terrible pounding from the air, especially from the giant B-52s. They were part of Operation Niagara, a name chosen appropriately to indicate a cascade of destruction, the most intensive bombardment in the history of warfare. More than 75,000 tons of explosives were dropped on enemy positions around Quezon. But simpler weapons also were at work as George Sievertson reported. They're using all kinds of sophisticated devices in this war, but here at Quezon, they've got one of the old black magic witches tools, the divining rod. They use them for detecting enemy tunnels, and they say they work. The North Vietnamese have been digging furiously in the Quezon area. The Marines here know they dug tunnels several miles in length into the French perimeter at Den Bien Phu, and they're on their guard. Every day they sweep the area in front of their wire and frequently they hit something. Have you found anything out there yet? Well, yes sir, we found uh, places we thought were tunnels and we'd dig for them. We'd dig down about six feet below the deck and figure there's nothing there and quit. So we're kind of skeptical. But then about, uh, about a week ago, one of the incoming rounds down here right in front of our wire uncovered one. And we discovered the reason we hadn't been finding them is because they're about seven feet now, not six. And we were just getting weren't patient enough, we were quitting too quick. The divining rods are made of two lengths of gas welding rods, about two feet long. The Marines have scrounged other devices for tunnel detection as well, including the old-fashioned doctor's stethoscope. Put on top of eight-foot stakes driven into the ground, they sometimes produce clear digging noises. Another way of discouraging the North Vietnamese tunnel builders is air power. Air strikes with napalm and high explosives 
burns off the protective cover for the entrances, and in some cases of caved in hidden bunkers and tunnels. Digging tunnels around here is dangerous business, as you can see, but the enemy has determination, and no one here doubts he'll keep right on digging. When the enemy wasn't digging, he was shooting. Jeff Graunick described what became a ritual at Quezon. From this position at the east end of Quezon's perimeter, the war is not a long-range fight between unseen enemy mortar crews and marine artillery. It is a short-range duel. The North Vietnamese out there, only 200 yards or less away. They are in those bomb craters and trenches, behind those piles of dirt. What appears to be a machine gun barrel poking out of one hole. From out there, the communists shoot at and hit almost every helicopter and cargo plane that flies into or over Quezon. Getting these pictures, difficult. The North Vietnamese sniping at cameraman Mike Marriott and Nguyen Vu as they filmed. But when they open fire, the communists run a risk. Forward observers sit here and wait, watching for the gun flashes, and then they shoot back. Target X-ray Delta 063, hold. Direction 1600. Direction 1600. Entering machine guns firing. Two guns, two rounds, fire for effect. Beautiful. Tell them repeat. Whiskey 62, repeat, over. Tell them right 25, repeat. Outstanding. Okay, tell them. Tell him in a mission report. Forward observer here, Marine Lieutenant Hank Norman, in Quezon since before the communists closed in. This time, he's trying to knock out a North Vietnamese machine gunner who has bounced several shots off the dirt piled up around his bunker. Does this go on often? It's kind of a duel between uh, the NVA and ourselves. They shoot at us, and they get down their holes, and we shoot back at them. It goes on like this day after day. This kind of dueling has been going on for weeks now. The only measure of success for Lieutenant Norman, whether the planes get in without okay, being shot at. The last on this day does, which means he either got the North Vietnamese out there or they have decided to wait until tomorrow. But tomorrow, they or others will be back and the duel will go on. The war of nerves at Quezon and the shock of the Tet Offensive became important political issues back home. 1968 was a presidential election year. Polls taken after Tet showed approval of President Johnson dropping sharply. On March 12th, he barely won the New Hampshire primary against an anti-war candidate, Senator Eugene McCarthy. Four days later, Robert Kennedy announced his candidacy for president. On March 31st, 1968, President Johnson went on television to announce a partial halt to the bombing of North Vietnam and to add a surprise announcement. I have concluded that I should not permit the presidency to become involved in the partisan divisions that are developing in this political year. With American sons in the field far away, with America's future under challenge right here at home, with our hopes and the world's hopes for peace and the balance every day, I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes or to any duties other than the awesome duties of this office, the presidency of your country. Accordingly, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Shortly before the president's announcement, a new military campaign began in Vietnam. It was called Operation Pegasus, and its purpose was to open the road to Quezon. Don Webster reported the progress of Pegasus. Marines are blasting open Route 9, which runs between Dong Ha and Quezon. 
So far, they've had only sporadic contact with the North Vietnamese, but they're taking no chances, blasting away at every suspected enemy position. Here, some caves are spotted halfway up a hill. The communists may have been using them to shell caissons, and the caves are located so that airstrikes can't reach them. No American has been down this road since last August. The communists have blown up the bridges, planted landmines, and somewhere between here and Quezon are probably waiting for a showdown with the Marines. While the Marines are clearing the road and guarding it, the Army's 1st Air Cavalry is invading and taking the hills on each side. The sky is filled with Army choppers flying over the heads of the Marines. The biggest chore for the Marine engineers is the bridges. The communists blew up almost all of them. Not only are new bridges being built, but bypass roads around the bridges are also being constructed. So even if the communists do blow up the bridge again, it won't block the road to Quezon. Using modern bridge building techniques, the work is going swiftly. A new 35-foot bridge will be built across this chasm in less than two days, strong enough to carry tanks. To make the road all weather, metal storm drains are also being installed. Further east, where Route 9 is more secure, it's turned into a busy highway. It's jammed with Army and Marine convoys. They carry in supplies not only to bases along the way, but also to the men on Operation Pegasus, and supplies that they hope will eventually go all the way to Quezon by truck. The reinforcements arrived in April as the 1st Air Cavalry moved into Quezon. The siege was ended after two and a half months, and the men of the 1st Cav were jubilant. How do you think the Marines feel about you being here? Well, I don't know how the Marines feel, but I'll tell you one thing, they don't have to worry about anything. The cab is here now. You think they had something to worry about before? Uh, I guess so, they did. They were, uh, well, for one thing, we clear uh, Highway 9. One time they were surrounded, now they're not, because we have an opening, Highway 9. By the 2nd second, uh, second and 7th, big company, we did that. One final irony remained. Two months after the siege ended, Quezon was being torn apart, the base abandoned. The official explanation was that Quezon was no longer needed. North Vietnam had found new infiltration routes. American strategy was moving back to mobile operations. George Severson and David Culhane described the last days of Quezon. When these films were made, the operation was still a secret. Marine officers refused to discuss the evacuation. But privately, there was consternation and some bitterness among the Marines. Why did we fight so hard to keep it if we were going to give it up like this, was the question some asked themselves. Others were relieved because they privately believed Quezon was of marginal strategic importance anyway. The North Vietnamese Army has been trying for months to do just this to blow up and burn out all the American bunkers at Khe Sanh. Now what the enemy could not accomplish, the Marines themselves are doing. At first, the Marines tore the bunkers apart and bulldozed earth into them. But for the past week, they've been in a bit of a hurry. So they set charges and blow the bunkers to pieces. The Marines are determined that Quezon will be of no use to the enemy when the Allied forces depart. Anything that cannot be salvaged is burnt. Cement bunkers are exploded and wooden shelters are burnt out. Material that is not worth carrying away by helicopter or truck is thrown into the fires. And if the fire doesn't do a complete job, then that bunker too is blown up. Men with gas masks continue to work in the area of the fire, throwing more expendable items into the blaze and making sure no one gets hurt. The combination of explosives and fire leaves virtually nothing that could be of any use to the enemy. That's the last bunker on this base. Now that the American troops have blown it up, there's nothing to protect them from enemy artillery. So now it's time for the final departure from Quezon. The Marines have carefully allocated shells for this last day at the base, and they get their final shots in. Then they quickly break down the gun emplacements, and trucks haul the weapons away to join the last convoy out. One or two bulldozers were left until the last day to cover over these gun positions. The long runway at Quezon was left in place. 
it was decided that the expense of removing it would not be justified in any future use. Now many people expect the enemy to cart it away bit by bit for use in building bunkers. The last convoy is ready to leave. Any troops left behind after this will either march out or be taken off by helicopter. But in these last weeks, the enemy has also been keeping tabs on the departure schedule. As the convoy shapes up at the assembly point, incoming artillery shells force the Marines to run for cover, a scarce commodity after all the bunkers have been destroyed. Finally, the convoy moves off. The day after the departure of the Marines, the base seemed from the air like some country garden, abandoned just after plowing. The only reminders of the war were the lonely airstrip, a few shell holes, and one burnt-out American truck, hit by artillery on the afternoon of the last day. Time usually reserves to itself the leisurely task of stripping a battleground of its emblems of suffering and valor. But now, as perhaps befits the strangest of wars, one of the most celebrated battlefields of Vietnam, in a few days, has been reduced once again to a simple meadow. It is possible the communists never intended to capture Khe San. They say now the siege was a diversionary tactic to draw American troops away from the cities. There's still much disagreement about the Tet Offensive. There's also debate about the role of journalists during that period. Some critics argue that after Tet, the enemy was on the ropes and might have been defeated. Instead, they say the media painted such a discouraging picture that America lost its will to fight and thereby lost the war. The argument is even made that newsmen took a Viet Cong defeat and portrayed it as a victory. Let me show you what we did report, an analysis filmed in Saigon on February 14, 1968 and broadcast on the CBS Evening News. First and simplest, the Viet Cong suffered a military defeat. Its missions proved suicidal. If they intended to stay in the cities as a negotiating point, they failed at that. The Vietnamese army reacted better than even its most ardent supporters had anticipated. There were no defections from its ranks as the Viet Cong apparently had expected. And the people did not rise to support the Viet Cong as they also were believed to have expected. But as we also pointed out, the communists had proven there was no security in Vietnam even in the cities. They had disillusioned those who hoped the war was almost over. They had set back the pacification program. Two weeks later, at the end of a special broadcast on Tet, I offered some further thoughts of my own. I described them then at the time as analysis that must be speculative, personal, subjective. And here is the conclusion of what I said. To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe in the face of the evidence the optimists who have been wrong in the past. To suggest we are on the edge of defeat is to yield to unreasonable pessimism. To say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. On the off chance, the military and political analysts are right. In the next few months, we must test the enemy's intentions in case this is indeed his last big gasp before negotiations. But it is increasingly clear to this reporter that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. It is believed the enemy lost at least 58,000 dead during Tet, perhaps three times that many wounded. The communist death toll was roughly six times that of Americans, South Vietnamese, and other friendly forces. But the communists did demonstrate their ability to plan and coordinate a massive nationwide attack, striking in surprisingly large numbers. In doing so, they gave new ammunition to American peace groups who argued that we had been deceived about enemy strength and about the prospects for victory. For years, there had been optimism, talk about light at the end of the tunnel. That light would never seem bright again after Tet. This is Walter Cronkite, and this has been another in a continuing series of video cassettes on the Vietnam War.